Hey everyone, and welcome to All Things Neuro. This is the first video in our concept series, and today we're going to be introducing neuromorphic devices. For those of you who are new to neuroscience or engineering, or have never heard the term neuromorphics, don't despair. I've provided additional resources in the description below to cover terminology and other material that are important, but are not the focus of this video. So, what are they? Neuromorphic and other biomorphic devices are designed using elements found in or inspired by nature. Neuromorphic devices specifically gain their inspiration from the study of neurons or the nervous system as a whole. The properties we learn about are then implemented by devices that mimic those observed properties. Neurons are one of the fundamental elements that comprise our nervous system. They are responsible for nearly every behavior we have from how we move and sense the world around us, to how we store memories and develop language and even dream. However, it would take nearly 60 years after their discovery in the 1880s for another major milestone to be reached, the development of a mathematical model describing how they operate. So, how do they operate? Well, that depends on the neuron, but there is one thing they all share, the voltage across the surface of neurons changes in response to stimuli. This property lays at the foundation for how neurons signal and create the wide range of processing abilities we possess. So, in order to create neuromorphic devices, we must understand how neurons operate in response to the signals we care about. Take, for example, the neurons in our retina. For the majority of people with sight, these neurons are exceptional at processing visual information whether it's the middle of the night and you're peering outside to see who's been raiding your trash bins, or it's your afternoon commute home and there's that stretch of road where the sun's directly in your eyes. Regardless of the situation, these neurons get you through it. In most vertebrates like us, sight begins with special neurons in the retina called photoreceptors. Light causes the photoreceptors to change the voltage observed across their surface. When the voltage changes, the neurons release special molecules called neurotransmitters. When there is less light and things get darker, the voltage across its surface increases, causing it to release more neurotransmitters. These voltage changes and neurotransmitters are ways in which neurons communicate with each other, and ultimately how we perceive the world around us through sight. Now, if we are to build a neuromorphic photoreceptor cell, it should have similar properties to the biological one. It doesn't need to release neurotransmitters, but its voltage should increase and decrease in a manner that is directly proportional to the biological photoreceptor. Here's an example of how a rod photoreceptor responds to light. Towards the left of the graph, where the brightness levels are lowest, the neurons have their maximal voltages. As the brightness increases, the voltage decreases. Now let's examine the response of a common device element in its operating range, the photodiode. Side by side, we can see the two curves are similar, but not exact. They are similar in that the photodiode's voltage also tracks with changing levels of brightness. However, it has the opposite behavior to our biological photoreceptor. Towards the left of this graph, as things get darker, the photodiode's voltage decreases instead of increasing like its biological counterpart. The engineering behind neuromorphics is an understanding how to combine other device elements to achieve the desired output. Not only can we match this one curve, but we can also match the various brightness adaptation curves as well. Now, this is just an illustration of how one might go from the biological understanding of a photoreceptor cell to device implementation. However, modeling one type of neuron in the retina will not give you a useful model or device for mimicking its full behavior. To create a useful neuromorphic retina device, our knowledge must expand to include the four additional classes of cells found in animal retina. These are bipolar, horizontal, amacrine, and ganglion cells, the last type being the outputs of the retina. And for each cell type, we must understand what it contributes to the overall output of signals leaving the retina. 
Ultimately, that's what we care about when making a device to mimic its function. Now, here's a schematic of a complete neuromorphic vision sensor. As you can see, it contains more than just the photoreceptor cells in its implementation, but it doesn't contain amacrine cells. There are many reasons why neuromorphic devices do not model biological designs one-to-one. -one. A big reason for this is the separation of function from form, a topic we'll address later in the series. Other reasons include limitations in the way we can physically build devices, and sometimes we just simply don't know enough about certain neurons or their connections. But nevertheless, incredible devices are still being built. Current research in neuromorphic engineering spreads across several properties observed in biology, not just retinas. This includes properties of brains and their ability to process sparse and distributed inputs into the wide range of conscious and subconscious functions we perform. Other sensory systems like hearing and smell and their amazing ability to always sense but signal in a very efficient and robust manner. And motor systems and their ability to effortlessly plan and execute complex movements in an ever-changing environment. This list is by no means exhaustive, but it does represent some key areas of past and present research in the field. Scientists and engineers are currently building neuromorphic devices in all these areas, and it's our understanding of neurons and our ability to create these models that allows the field to progress. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to neuromorphic devices. And if you like what you learned today, there's a lot more content being planned, so please subscribe. I'm Corey Fernando, and this is All Things Neuro. Until next time, please take care. Yeah.